What a blessing that is. Good to see you all. It's a blessing to be back here in Philadelphia, one of my favorite places, favorite churches to come. We've been a, a good friend of your pastor, I guess about six or seven years anyways now, and uh, we've had the privilege of doing some remodeling on your buildings. We really appreciate the Lord giving us the ability to do that and, and use it. Uh, you don't usually get to bring my wife with me. She's always jealous when I come down, so I'll introduce you to my wife, Adela. Stand up and, and say hello. Isn't she cute? They tell me I married way over my head. It's true. It is very true. You, I've talked about her before. She was the one who was crazy enough to marry me with six kids. Six kids are all right, but to live with me, I don't know. I recently shaved my beard. Uh, I came into Brother Burton's house tonight, and Amelia looks at me. Burton says, you know, him's Brother Bolliff. She had no idea, no clue. Then Paul comes in with Jenna. She goes... I shaved it off at home and went to my youngest daughter, my favorite granddaughter. Her name is Rosalie. I call her Lily. She puckered her lip till I talked. But worse than that, when I first shaved it, my wife wouldn't let me in the house for three days. <laughs> but I do feel better. I feel younger. I'm not a hillbilly anymore. I'm kind of a... I feel younger. I feel cleaner. I feel better. You guys got beards. It's okay. I appreciate that. You got rid of yours even. I can't believe it. We're all going the same direction. Yeah. When he called me this afternoon, we were driving, and he asked me to preach, and I said I'd be glad to do that. The Lord brought one message to mind quickly, and I'm going to preach secondarily. And I talked to, I'm not usually conflicted about, I hate that word because it's a psychobabble word, but I'm not usually uh, worried about what I'm going to preach. I, but the Lord was kind of leading me two directions, I thought, until I lay down in the bed this afternoon, and I got the Brother Burton's to take a little rest, and he wouldn't let me preach the message that I wanted to. I have a message that's about the founding fathers' faith. We hear often that they were a bunch of white guys that, you know, all this nonsense, and they were deists, and uh, they weren't, but they were really Christians. They were right. based on the whole country on Christian ideology. The Great Awakening had just swept through Europe, jumped over the pond to America, and they were really influenced with that. 24 of the 56 signers were seminary graduates. Interesting thing, all 54 pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. All of them died losing their lives and their fortunes, but not their honor. Right. They, they stuck to that. Kind of like the disciples who saw Jesus. Yeah, that's right. They knew the truth, and no matter what happened, they would not turn from the truth. But that's not what the Lord let me preach. And then uh, we read from Romans 5. So I'm going to be Romans 8 if you want to turn there quickly. Romans is a great book. I enjoy the book of Romans. The first eight chapters are a very quintessential text or exposition on Christian doctrine. And we have a little parenthesis in there of 9 through 11, which talks about Israel. And then chapter 12 to the end talks kind of about our life and our relationship to the Lord. So we're going to end up at the end section of the quintessential part of the Christian doctrine tonight. Uh, when she read from Romans 5, I had preached a message here from Romans 5, 2, 3, and 4, where uh, tribulation, worth, patience, patience, experience, experience, hope a number of years ago. And Paul leaned over, so I remember that. That was good. But that was kind of the tip of the iceberg, and Paul is leading up to chapter 8, and chapter 8 is really an exclamation point, uh, if you could. Let's stand, we'll read uh, verse 28. Keep, don't close your Bibles, we're going to go to verse 29 a little bit later. We've heard this verse over and over and over and over and over again. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. We all believe it. Yeah. But there's something about it as I studied about a month and a half or two months ago. And I'll tell you the story behind that in just a moment. The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the what? Called, Called according to his what? purpose. Father, thanks for the evening tonight. Yes, thank you. Father, I, I, I appreciate you changing the message. I'm going to trust you. Yes. I'm just flesh here tonight. And I have a fleshly mind. I, and, and you give me the Holy Spirit in me. Have him do the work tonight. Yeah. Have him say the things I need to say, Father. And, uh, there must be somebody or something, some reason for this message tonight. I'm going to leave that up to you and leave up the Holy Spirit to convict folks. But I always pray this, and I pray it again tonight, that when we leave, we're we're convicted by the Holy Spirit. We're convinced by the Holy Spirit. We're changed by the Holy Spirit before we leave tonight. 
And a lot of that work will be done right down here at the altar in just a little bit. We're thankful for that. Now bless us. We'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I did not mention that I love the work up here. This is gorgeous. This is, this is beautiful. I wish I had done it. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, and a bunch of you folks in the church had done it. You did a great job. And, and I couldn't find any fault with it. You did real good, Paul. I hate to say it. I'm a carpenter. I go into a restaurant, and I look around, and I see all the mistakes. <laughs> did a great job. It was a wonderful thing. There was a, there was a book written a number of years ago about an f- ill-fated trip up the Himalayan mountains up into Mount Everest. It was a book written by Jack Krakow. It was about an ill-fated trip in 1996. There were four, five men who attempted to climb up Mount Everest. Mount Everest is 29,058 feet tall. That's just a little bit short of how many miles? Any mathematicians here? Just short of six miles. There's 5,200 feet in a mile. Five times 52 would be 27,000, so it's a little over five miles, five and a half miles high. How far from here? Can you think of something from here that's five and a half miles away? Anyways, that's what they did. And one of the, there was a, there was a pathologist from Dallas by the name of Dr. Beck Weather, Weathers with them. And of the five men who attempted to go up to the peak, four of them died. They got caught in an extremely terrible blizzard and in fact, Dr. Weathers was left for dead. They thought he was dead. And by some interpersonal, some personal drive, and I don't know what would do it, he picked himself up and, and walked himself back off the mountain. In fact, because of that, he lost one of his arms and fingers on the other hand, a maimed for life, and yet he still had a, a very healthy and very good uh, medical practice in Dallas after that. And I can't for the life of me understand why somebody wants to climb that high. I don't like the cold. I, I don't think I'd want that trek. We just came from the south. I'd rather sweat than shiver any day. But these men did that, and they've asked men why they would want to climb to the top of Mount Everest. And they said, because the view from up there is incredible. It's incredible. It's worth risking their lives, they feel. And, and in fact, they do that. So this is what was happening. And if I could relate chapter 8 of Romans to climbing up Mount Everest, that's kind of where we are today. And if I could equate verse 28 with reaching the apex or the pinnacle of Mount Everest, that's where we're going to be today. We walk all the way through Romans. We see a lot of doctrinal things. We're thankful for our salvation. Can I get an amen with that? Uh, We're thankful for what Christ did, his is taking our place on the cross, is paying the penalty for us. What a blessing that is. And then we get down here to this particular verse, and if I could, it's a pretty lofty point. I like to call it the Mount of Glory here in chapter 8. Uh, verses 1 through uh, about 17 uh, talk about some glorious things, and then verses 18 down through about 27, he's talking about some suffering, but then you come back up to the pinnacle uh, and verse uh, 28. And something interesting, if you would, as men climb up the Himalayas, they climb up Mount Everest, they have a camp just below the peak. It's before the final ascent. And many times when men get to that point, they have to stop and rest for sometimes a few hours, sometimes for a day or two, to recoup their energy from climbing up that high and also to get their bodies acclimated to the air, the thin air that they're going to encounter the rest of the way up. They take a little pause. So now some of us in this room have taken a little pause already, and we've read verse 20. That's dangerous. We've read verse 28. I heard, I heard you're not supposed to step on the bull nose. Are we okay now? We, we, we've stopped before verse 28, and we've kind of stopped and taken a rest. But now it's time for us to understand this verse a little bit more. And it's time for us to take it to heart and trust God a little bit more uh, in this particular spot. Now, the verse is very simple. And we what? What's the next word? We know. What? That all things work for good. To them that are called. To them that love God. To them that are the called according to his purpose. Now, what do we know? That's an interesting question. What do we know? Well, I know one thing. I know God's character. Yeah. I'm glad that God is love. Amen. I'm glad God is gracious. 
I'm glad God is compassionate. I'm glad he never changes. I'm glad I can trust him. I'm glad that he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I'm glad that he is going to welcome me into heaven one day with open arms. I'm glad he's going to walk up to me and hopefully he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I know those things. We know. We know who he is because we've experienced him. But there's something else we know is because of our experiences that this verse works. And we what? Know. How do we know by our experiences? I could have folks raise their hand today, tonight in church and say, uh, Pastor, I've gone through some things and I know that God has been with me and walked through them with me. I know he is always there by my side. He takes me into the field of grace and I can stay as long as I need to until I'm healed. We've done that. We've experienced it. And we know, we know, we know, we know. And if you don't know, make sure you know. And if you don't know him, oh, my word, you're missing the greatest thing on the face of the planet. It's out of this world. We one day will get to see him. He gave a special gift for us. He gave a son. He gave a son. God gave a son to die for us. We have seven children. We just had our 18th grandbaby yesterday. A little girl by the name of Layla Robin. Cute little thing. She's a toddler. She weighed 10 pounds, one ounce. She came out walking. Her mom was as big as a house. Don't tell her I said that. Shut that thing off real quick and erase that in case she's watching. No, she's a 19th grandbaby. 19th. I got all the kids on my phone on the notes. We're having number 20 in August. What a cool thing. Remember this, Burton. Grandkids are the blessing for not killing your own kids. So we have seven children. They're all boys, but six of them. I've told you that before. I have one son. I kind of like my son. You like your son? You got one boy. I love my son. I like you, but I love my son. I love your preacher. I love Brother Paul. But I don't think I could ever give my son to die for Burton. Or I let them die for him. But I don't think I can let him die for them. I don't love you all that much. Right. Worse than that, they're my friends. Yeah. We were God's enemies. Yeah. And he loved us enough to give us that gift of a son, a perfect gift of Jesus Christ. And we know. We know all these things. But it goes on to say, but, and we know that all things work together. So we know what? What's the next word? That, what's that word? All. What does all mean? Any scholars in here? Any English majors? All. All means all. 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 Not the detergent. (laughs) All. All. We know all things. So there's not anything left out of this verse. There's not anything left out of anybody's life. There's not anything left out of the whole world. All things. We know all things. Work for what? Come on, you're kidding me. What's that word? Good. Good. Brother Ben, would you say getting diabetes is good? Shake your head this way. No. No. I was working at my father-in-law's, putting up some fans. They had one of those fancy metal ladders that fold, and they took those magic ladders. I'm out in the garage, and I'm trying to fold it up, and one of the things fell out and smashed the top of his foot, and it's big black and blue. That wasn't good. It wasn't good. Our daughter... Our youngest daughter, Lily's mom, my favorite granddaughter. She was pregnant. Her and two of her sisters were pregnant. And they're going to have babies together this summer. But my younger, youngest daughter, Amanda, found out about six months ago that her little baby had trisomy 18. Trisomy 18 is where you're supposed to have two sets of chromosomes on the 18th pair, little Evelyn had three. Evelyn wasn't going to be viable. Is that good? Is that good? No, what caused that? Anybody know what caused that? S-I-N. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. It's sin. Uh, we look out our living room window, and we look up on top of a little hill, and there's a really beautiful home sits up on the hill. It's Lost two teachers in our school district in Oakfield, Dan and Sue Gilbert. Dan was 44 years old and contracted colon cancer. 
Dan was the coach at the high school and the athletic director and the and a gym teacher. And Dan just passed away a year ago in March. Young fella, left two kids behind. Had an opportunity to talk with Sue and uh, what's her daughter's name again? I can't think of it right off the top of my head. But she was mad. She's been bitter. She's been bitter. It wasn't good that her dad died. But I had to explain to her it's not God's fault. Your dad got cancer. It's sinfulness. It's the sin we have in us. It's the degradation of the body due to sin. We're all going to die. And the sin is, the, the, the thing is, was it good that her dad died? No, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. How, how, how do you suppose God felt? When Jesus was standing before Pilate, or before Herod and his chosen people were railing against the son, the Messiah they sent to save him. Do you think he thought it was good his chosen people were heckling Jesus? Do you think he thought it was good when he, the Roman soldiers took the cat of nine tails and lashed him and pulled the meat off his back every time he hit him? Do you think God thought it was good when they drove the thorns down into his head and bled. Do you think it was, God thought it was good when they put the robe on his back and all that blood that had coagulated into the robe as it's laid there for a while and they ripped the robe off and pulled more of the meat off the back? Do you think God thought that was good for his son? And then when Jesus was nailed through the hands and feet, do you think God thought that? No, I wouldn't. If it was my boy, I wouldn't think it was good. And then he hung there, and the weight of the sin was on his person. All of the sin of all of the world, past, present, and future, was on Jesus' shoulders. And God was so taken by that, so, so character in that, that because the sin was there, he had to turn his back on his son. Do you think it was good? He thought... His boy was carrying that load of sin. I don't think he thought it was good. So not everything is what? Is that what the verse says, that everything is good? And we know that all things work for good. Now, it's an interesting thing about that. I heard a man say this not too long ago. In that verse, it says, all things work together for Bruce's good. Does it say that there? Put your name in there. All things work for, does it say that? It doesn't say that anywhere, does it? It doesn't even say that all things work together for the good. Didn't even put that little direct article in there, the good, to define it a little bit more. He kept it very broad. The Holy Spirit was making sure that we understood that it was covering everything. He said all things work together for what? Even Dan Gilbert passing away. Gave me an opportunity, I didn't tell you this, but I witnessed the mom and daughter. In fact, Dan got saved by the charismatic pastor downtown, thankfully. It wasn't good that my daughter's baby had trisomy 18. She was born the 22nd of May, but there was something good in it. The fellow in our church that were helping start a church plant in Lockport, he and his wife just the year before in August had a boy die of the same thing. Trisomy 18. And like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that sometimes God gives us some things that we go through so we can help other people that we go through it. Scott and Imelda were able to help Ricky and Amanda go through that because they understood it. They empathized with it. Was it good that two babies in the same church came down with the exact same malady? No. Was it fun to do the funerals of both of those babies a year apart? No. But all things work together for good. For good. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. You've got to be kidding me. All of my tra tra travesties, all of my trials, all of my tribulations work for good. Now, wait a minute. That's what the verse says, but unfortunately, there's a little disclaimer here. I call this God's unfailable or infallible guarantee. How many of you buy products that you make sure with the product you buy, you're going to get a warranty 
that is collectible. Have you ever bought something and you tried to go cash in the warranty? So I'm sorry, we don't cover that. When I buy tools, I try to buy Craftsman or s &K or k or Rigid or something rigid. Something that's going to have a warranty so that if I break it, I'm tough on equipment, I want them to replace it. If I buy a piece of equipment for the house, a, a, a washer or a dryer, I want something that's got a good warranty. Or I buy, you ought to drive a Ford, they got a good warranty. You got to grow up and drive Fords. Okay. First on race day. It's not flip over, read directions. It's a Ford. But I want to have a guarantee. Can I say this is God's infallible yeah. guarantee? But there's a little disclaimer in here. It's the last part of the verse. For we know that all things work together for good. Here's the disclaimer. To them that love God and to them that are the called according to his purpose. They're kind of like bookends. They're kind of like both ends of it, and you've got to be in between it. What do you mean? I have to be in between it. He says, to those that love God. How many in this room this evening would say, I love God? Is it eat? Wait a minute, I'm going to do some. Y'all got your steel toe shoes on? Take them off. It's easy to give lip service to say you love God. We know we love him when we keep his. We know we love him when we keep his. When was the last time we went soul winning? When was the last time you helped a brethren that had fallen down in the church and didn't shoot him? When was the last time you gave sacrificially? Let me give you an example of sacrifice. A chicken and a pig both give to breakfast. The chicken makes an offering, the pig makes a sacrifice. Right. <laughs> Cost the pig a little something. If you like sausage, if you like bacon, they're both great. Get your food illustrations in here. Eggs and offering. Chicken's going to be back tomorrow. The pig is going to give everything. When was the last time you gave God everything? You will know you love him if you keep his commandments. To them that love, it's a bookend. How many of you want to have the promise that all things work together for good? Boy, I do. Now, remember I told you this is kind of the apex. This is the pinnacle of chapter 8. This is climbing all the way up where the air is thin. This isn't for pablum Christians. This is for the meat eaters. This is for the Thursday night crowd. This is for those who want to go the next step. These are the ones that are, that are ready, that are mature. To them that love God, do you love him? It's easy to say it. Yeah, I love God. I love him because he first. I know the verse. I love him because he first loved me. But the, the truth of the matter is in the obedience that's whether or not we love him. Interesting thing with my children, and I, I'm thankful for this. I didn't push for this, but it worked out well. We were sitting around a table about five or six years ago. And now it is when your kids, you, you might not, when your kids come home and you're sitting around a table talking after a meal or it's late at night and you're having some, playing some games or something, you're just chatting. And I wanted to find out why our kids always seem to do all right. And I said to him, why did, you, why did you always do what I asked you to do? Why did you not go and do some of the things some of the other kids in church did that got in trouble? And I don't remember which one of it spoke up. Do you remember which one said it? One of them said this. He says, Dad, we didn't want to disappoint you. Do you act like you don't want to disappoint God? They loved me. They didn't want to disappoint me. To them that love what? Who? God. If you love him, you'll keep his commandments. If you love him, you won't want to disappoint him. 
Now, you know, this is a saying we use all the time. You may be the only Bible someone ever reads. Don't be a stumbling block for somebody else. How do you do that? Don't worry about them. Don't try to act good for them. Don't try to be a testimony for them. Just try to please God. Right. It all falls in place. We are too often wanting to lay down a bunch of laws, a bunch of rules of what we ought not to do so we appear to be Christian. But if we love God, it's right. easy. That's right. That's right. Got a guy in my church that says, Preacher, I have liberty in Christ. I can do whatever I want. Excuse me. No, liberty is the freedom to do what you should with a moral ethic or a moral code behind it, and I hold that moral code in my hand. Right. Your liberty is to do what he asks you to do and That's do what right. pleases him. For them that love God. So how are you doing on the love part? Do you love God? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. That's the first part of it. And to them that are called, to them that are the called, according to his purpose. There's a lot of Christians today that won't, don't want to take the next step in becoming what God has designed them to be for right. him. That's right. I don't know why. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they're timid. Maybe they have little faith. Maybe they don't have much trust. We were out in India. We just made a world tour vacation. We went from New York out to Louisville and saw six of our grandbabies. We went down to Tennessee, spent three days in the cabin, went over to Columbia, and I preached on Sunday. Columbia, South Carolina, I preached on Sunday. Went over to Myrtle Beach, spent three days. We ran up to Philadelphia, and tomorrow we're running back home. But I was out in Louisville. My, youngest, my grandson out there, Ashton, man, he's a cute little bugger. I'll show you a picture. He's so cute. Oh, it's covered up. I won't uncover. You can see his face. He's a cute little bugger anyways. No, oh. oh, tell me. Go ahead. That's cute. Yeah. <laughs> this kid is fearless. And he trusts me implicitly. He jumps up in my arms. I grab him by the, by the hand, by the, right here, what do you call him, by the hips, the lower hips. And I can take that kid and lift him up and go deep to deep. And I can put him all the way up to the ceiling as high as I can reach. And he just loves it. You know why? He trusts Peppa. He's not afraid. I do that to Lily. She's got a hold of my hair and she's betting to you. Don't let me out, Peppa. I'm scared. How many of us are Lily? Yeah. And how many of us are Ashton? I lift Ashton up. Dee, dee, dee. He's got a big grin on his face. He's looking up to the ceiling. Do it again. Boom, boom, boom. Knock some sense into me, Papa. Okay. Do you trust God? Here's a better question. It has nothing to do with you. Is he trustworthy? Yes. <laughs> Is he trustworthy? Yes. Amen. Now, maybe this doesn't go for everybody. But when you drove here, how many of you went over a bridge? Anybody drive over a bridge coming here tonight? You didn't? Sorry. There's no bridges? <laughs> Huh? Under the bridge? All right. How many went through a traffic light? Did you have faith after the thing turned green on your side that the other side was red and people would stop? No, not in Philadelphia, I didn't. That didn't work either. I can't use my country hicks. Do you trust God? You put faith, how many of you when you sat down didn't think that chair was going to fall yeah, down and down. bend under you? I got a couple of guys in my church I have questions about every time they sit down. No, I shouldn't say. It's pretty big guys. They're sumo wrestlers. Yeah. Without the sumo. <laughs> I hope that's not going on. Oh, never mind. <laughs> to them that are the called according to his purpose. Yeah. Why don't people take that next step? Afraid, timid, no trust, lack of faith. Mm -hmm. When the one that we should be putting our faith in is the one who holds the universe, 
not just in his hand, but by his word. His word is powerful enough. Now, everybody in this room is completely different. Not everybody's as good looking as I am. Not as cute as my wife. But everybody in this room has been made by God. You are fearfully and what? Wonderfully made. God knew you before the foundations of the world. He knew you in your mother's womb. And just like a computer circuit board, he has wired you to do something that the person to your right or left or in front of you and back of you cannot and does not have the ability to do. I'm not a guy that can come down to Philly and plant a church here. Love coming here. I don't think I can live here. I like the fresh air. God's made me a country boy. Um, as, as Jace calls me, I'm the farmer. But he wired Brother Burton to be able to come down here, and Brother Burton had to go through some things that probably weren't good so he could do the things that God had called him to do in Philly. He's wired Brother Paul, maybe not to be a senior pastor, but he's wired Brother Paul, maybe because his dad was such a strong man, to learn how to be submissive that he could be a good second man and do what the first man needed to be done so that these two could work in harmony to get everything done that's here. That's the purpose he was called to, and this is the purpose that he was called to. And he has great vision. Paul is willing in his submissive role to support his vision that came from who? God. That the call according to his purpose. The call according to his purpose. Now let's back up. We know, we all know, that all things work together for what? Good. To them that love and to them that are... No, no, no. There's a, there's a direct article in there. The call. That means that not everybody's called. Let's back up. We know that all things work together for good for those that love God and to the, those that are the called. And I said, not everybody's called. Look at verse 29. Everybody there? 829. For whom he did foreknow. Did he know you before the beginning of the world? He did. Now, I'm not a Calvinist. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe in all this predestination like they believe it. Right. But he says, he did predestinate to be what? Conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He has chosen you before the beginning of time to be conformed to the image of who? His son. His son. What did his son do? That's what we're to be conformed to, what Jesus did all through the New Testament, all through this book. So we are all the what? Called. So don't say you're not, I'm not called to be a pastor. I'm not called to be an assistant pastor. I'm not called to be a song leader. I'm not called to be a missionary. I'm not called to be a bus driver. I'm not called to be a junior church worker. I'm not called to be a Sunday school worker. I'm not called to work in super church on Sunday. I'm not called to knock doors. I'm not called to blah, 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 ad nauseum. Stop your excuse. Jesus! Right. Yes, sir. Amen. And be what you are, the called. Amen. Right. Yeah, amen. Now, we want the blessing. All things work together for good. How many want that? That everything that happens in your life is, will be, and will ultimately work out for good. I want that. But there's, a, there's that little bookend. The good's in the middle. Those that love God and those that are the called according to his purpose. You have to both love him and do what he's asking you to do. So all of these things in the middle that you go through work out for good. good. Because if you're not loving him or not being in his purpose, you won't let it become good. You will make, let it make you become bitter. And you have a choice. You can become bitter or you can become better. Lots of bitter people in the world. Now, how many want the good?
Do you love God? Not lip service. Not showing up for church. Not reading your Bible. Not praying. All those are important. If he loved me, keep my... Are you doing what he's asked you to do in this book? If there's visitation Saturday, I challenge you to love him and come. Right. That's right. Come on. You got your steel toes off. I should have heard a yelp if I didn't hear an amen. amen. If there's visitation on... When's your visitation? Saturday. Saturday. You ought to be here. Because you love God. Because you're becoming conformed to the image of his son. You're called to a purpose. And you want the good. But you're not so sure of the qualifiers. Can you trust God? Say it again, William. You can. How have you had God work miracles in your life? Money's an easy one to have him be proved in. Your, your preacher and I aren't these guys on TV that send us, say, send your money and we'll send you the, the anointing oil or the prayer cloth or give us $1,000 seed money so God can bless you. We're not saying that. But the Bible does say in Malachi that this is the one place you can prove him. Right. And Luke says that men will give unto your bosom, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Right. If you sow sparingly, you will... Reap sparingly. That's an easy place to trust him. So do you love him? Are you called according to his purpose? Yes, you are. Are you fulfilling it? Follow his commandments and allow him to, what's that verb in that, in that part of that phrase? Be ye what? Conform? I don't like that word. You know what it means to be conformed? That's putting this 46 long body into a 42 short suit. <laughs> I won't use lady sizes. I get in trouble. That's jamming size 11 feet into size 8 shoes. That's taking and putting some pressure on you to change your shape. Right. That's right. Putting pressure on you to change your shape. Mm-hmm. You've heard the story about the potter and the clay, and the potter knows how much pressure to put on the clay and how many times around the wheel the clay needs to go for the potter to make it into a useful pot. Here's my question. How long are you going to do this and not let the potter push you into what your conforming spot is? How many are you going to be submissive and let him conform you? So that you can be used in the purpose he's called you to. Do you love him? Obedience. He's got a purpose, but you've got to be what first? Conform. And we want the good. I'm not saying everything that happens in your life is good. And we can go around the room tonight and people say, Pastor, this happened in our life, and this tragedy happened in our life, and this thing happened, and we didn't understand this, blah, blah, blah. Happen, and you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you get those things for a blessing so you can be a blessing to others as they go through them. That's just part of it. But it's all things work together for what? Good. Good. To them that love God. To them that are what? The called. If he's conforming you, if he's putting pressure on you, it's confirmation that you are called. It's confirmation that he has something for you to do. Right. Stop, as he told Paul, kicking against the pricks. Stop kicking against the goat pricks. How many want the good? I do. Father, thanks for the evening of blessing. Father, we've seen many things in our ministry that weren't good. We've seen travesty.